Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm still Martha Minow, and it is my great delight to welcome you to HLS Thinks Big, which is here because of the superb work from Kathy and Katie uh, and many others who helped to plan it, and also because of the TED Talks. How many of you have seen a TED Talk? So TED Talks are like awesome, right? And one reason that they're awesome is that they're short. And uh, it's also that they're awesome because amazing people are uh, invited to uh, present. And there were uh, inspirations from the TED Talks that, uh, that actually produced a wave uh, across many institutions, including Harvard. It was initially some undergraduates who had the idea of, why don't we have TED Talks at Harvard? And then Harvard Law School said, why don't we have TED Talks at Harvard Law School? Um, and Harvard Thinks Big is the result. The growing roster of um, faculty participants uh, is added to this year with some wonderful, wonderful people. And again, I, I thank uh, Kathy Th uh, Thurman and, and Katie Grinna for helping to organize this. Um, there also, this year for the first time, was a Harvard Law School Thinks Big initiative that was students speaking. So there's one very interesting dimension of this um, that I'm going to mention right now, which is the time. There's a timekeeper, and the people who are going to come up and speak will actually have the minutes counted in front of them. And 10 minutes come, and they actually have to wrap up at 10 minutes. That's challenging when people are asked to talk about like the thing that they're passionate about. So besides uh, being very grateful to uh, our speakers for their willingness to speak, I'm especially grateful for their willingness to speak under these conditions. Um, the last thing that I want to say is uh, that this initiative represents, in my view, one of the most um, important dimensions of this entire institution, which is we are about learning. It's a learning institution. It's about everybody having the chance to learn and everybody having the chance to grow. And that's why, again, I'm just so very grateful to everyone who um, participated in making it happen. We're going to hear today from Professor Dan Nagan, Professor Glenn Cohen, Professor Jeannie Sook, and Professor uh, Jim Greiner. I'm going to tell you their topics. And the order uh, in which they'll speak is the order in which I've just described them. Um, and I will get up in between just to tell you a little bit about the person. Um, the topics, Dan Nagan will talk about bureaucratic knots, uh, veterans benefits for the 21st century. Glenn Cohen will talk about the globalization of healthcare. Jeannie Sook will talk about the trauma society. And Jim Greiner will talk about a nerd in every court and law office. Um, so Dan Nagan, uh, for those of you who haven't yet met him, you're in for uh, an enormous treat. Um, he's uh, joined the faculty just this past year as clinical professor uh, uh, and as director of our community-based lawyering at the HLS Law Clinic uh, in the Legal Services Center in Jamaica Plain. And he came to uh, our institution having previously founded and directed the Family Resource Clinic at University of Virginia Law School. And uh, he also had prior work, uh, both as a clinical professor and as a practicing lawyer. And his work involves a focus on clinical education, social welfare law, and policy, and asset accumulation for low wealth communities. And I had the great good fortune of convincing Dan to come here. And in our conversations, we talked about what might be future horizons, what would make it exciting? And one thing that Dan said was, what about tackling the unmet legal needs of veterans? Which he has made enormous progress in addressing just in this very first year. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dan Nagan. Join me. Thank you, Dean Minow. I now have nine minutes left. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the VA claims backlog. I'm going to assume some familiarity, familiarity with the topic, given how much it's been in the media. And I'm going to jump into a, things relatively quickly. Uh, in the Veterans Legal Clinic, we represent veterans, family members, survivors at all levels of the administrative and court appeal process. 
Um, I think it's appropriate here the day after Memorial Day that we have occasion to talk about the needs of veterans. So let me tell you uh, just a quick story that uh, emerges from our clinic experience um, as our entry point into talking about the backlog. And by backlog, very briefly, I mean um, the enormous weight that veterans are experiencing at VA waiting for service-connected uh, disability compensation claims to be decided and then decided on appeal. Um, so uh, veteran uh, comes back from serving in Afghanistan um, doing his, could be her, but his best here to uh, cope with um, returning to civ uh, civilian life. Um, Things go okay, but then they go a little downhill, and eventually um, the veteran seeks some help and realizes um, that he's uh, dealing with some serious PTSD, among other issues. Um, in talking to veterans and supporters and others, the veteran ultimately applies for uh, disability benefits, uh, compensation benefits from VA. Um, so then the question becomes, the veteran asks, well, when must VA decide my claim? And you say, must? Well, I could tell you when they might, but I actually can't tell you when they must because, oh, there's no actual hard external statutory or regulatory deadline. There is no deadline. The claim goes into the bureaucracy. Who knows when it will be decided? We'll talk in a moment about what the current averages are, but you really don't know. So now the same veteran who's in a difficult financial spot applies for food stamps or SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And the veteran says, well, when must they decide my claim? Or is it like VA, where it's just unknown? There's only a maybe answer. Well, there's actually an answer. There's a statute, a federal statute, that says 30 days. Now, there are some exceptions in either direction, in fact. There's expedited food stamps for certain uh, persons who uh, meet uh, financial eligibility requirements um, because of the crisis they're in, seven days. Now, obviously, there are some exceptions where the food stamp office can take longer, um, but there's an actual statute that says 30 days. So let's, our veteran continues on his journey trying to get help and support. Let's assume that the veteran times out of his VA health care. He doesn't have a service-connected disability. Seeks Medicaid. Is there an answer to the question how long? Yes. 90 days if the basis of eligibility is disability and even shorter, 45 days, if it's simply a financial question. So in the two contexts, SNAP or food stamps and Medicaid, there's an answer. In the VA context, there is no answer. And that's what I want to talk about. Why is it that one program, this big, enormous program for veterans, has no deadline, why the other programs do, and why we aren't talking about having hard external deadlines for veterans' benefits? Now. Um, we can't talk about the backlog in all of its complexity, uh, given our short time today, but I want to make two points. One is that we can look at benefit programs like the ones I just mentioned much more than we have been. I think there's been a failure, if you will, of imagination, which is the analogy for VA benefits in the discussion about how to fix the backlog is mostly to disability claims before Social Security Administration. And that has a certain logic to it. But I want to suggest that analogies to other benefit programs also have great value, and we should look at that. The second point I want to leave you with is that social science research about psychology and uh, organizations actually suggests that imposing an external hard deadline on VA will make a huge difference. So very quickly, let's start just by giving some context. The backlog is real. Its consequences are devastating. It took, on average, almost 300 days for an initial decision on a claim. 70% of claims have been pending for over 125 days. Don't ask me how many claims have been pending for years. And then once things get appealed, uh, it doesn't get any better. It actually slows things down, and there are claims going up the pipe and coming down the pipe, creating a huge clog. VA says it's going to fix the problem by 2015, reduce the backlog entirely. And this is VA's metric so that all claims are decided, new claims are decided within 125 days. Remember that 125-day benchmark. We're going to come back to that in a moment. Um, and they're going to do so with 98% accuracy. And there are a number of components to the plan. I won't go through them all. Um, but many are skeptical that VA is going to meet its goal. Now, there's no single solution to the VA backlog. But something is missing, and it's this analogy, which is disability benefits from Social Security have a lot in common with VA benefits. 
It's an enormous, costly program. It deals with difficult, difficult questions of medical evidence. It deals with um, tremendous amounts of documents and outside providers. They're very, very similar programs in lots of ways. Um, moreover, the biggest piece of Social Security that people talk about is the disability program, which is not means-tested. I'm leaving to the side the means-tested programs. So the programs kind of feel the same because VA compensation benefits are not means-tested either. But I think the SSA analogy, the Social Security analogy, is actually very constricting. Um, and that returns us to the story of our Afghanistan war veteran. Because we need to think about other programs that haven't yet been part of the discussion when we think about how we can fix VA. So one of the reasons, I think, that we don't talk about food stamps and Medicaid when we're talking about models for how to improve VA is because those programs have a different feel and a very different perception, and the politics are entirely different. Those programs are considered charitable programs for the so-called deserving poor. Those benefits aren't earned, they're given. Compensation benefits, it's compensation in the name. Those benefits are earned. And hence, there's a, there's a reluctance to think about other kinds of programs when we're trying to think about how to fix the VA backlog. But why should it be, I ask you, why should it be that someone who's in need is entitled to an external, congressionally imposed deadline for the processing of a claim for food stamps and Medicaid, why wouldn't that same logic apply to veterans? So that's my first point. Let's look at other analogies. And indeed, if you look at the current proposals to how to fix the problem, no one is talking about an externally imposed hard deadline. And they should. Ten bills were introduced last month in the House to fix the backlog. And those are well-intentioned bills. They'll probably do some good, but none of them go right at the problem. Why not have an external, congressionally imposed deadline? So let me get to my second point, which is what does social science have to teach us about this problem? So empirical studies of individuals shows that people are more likely to comply with externally imposed deadlines than internally imposed deadlines. And you know what? You probably could have figured that out without a study, right? In fact, many of the studies involve students and whether they decide their own schedule for completing work or have the schedule imposed from above, if you will. Well, the same logic can apply to individuals within larger organizations and agencies. And not only that, the social science research teaches us that far away deadlines actually don't necessarily produce better work or better outcomes than closer in deadlines because of our natural optimism about how and when we will get things done. Well, let's keep going with the social science research. Uh, Professor Tom Tyler and many others have studied procedural justice and perceptions of fairness in systems. Well, think about this. In the VA, the veteran has all the deadlines. A deadline to file an initial appeal called a notice of disagreement. A hard deadline also to file what's called a substantive appeal. And then a third deadline to file an appeal to court that's a hard externally imposed deadline. So the veteran's perception, perception of the system is that he or she is subject to all of the external hard deadlines, and the VA on the other side is subject to none at all. And this creates a perception problem, which is people tend to think more highly of a system merely based not so much on outcomes, although that's hugely important, but also on a sense of fairness and opportunity to be heard. And this is a fundamental unfairness in the system, is that there's no answer for the veteran, but there is an answer on the other side about the veteran's <coughs> obligations to the VA. And that's a fundamental problem. Now, uh, let me make a few last points before I wrap up. There are other good reasons to do this, not just the ones I mentioned, but I wanted to highlight those because I think they can help inform the discussion. Another one is that the courts, and this was especially evident in a recent uh, decision, en banc decision by the Ninth Circuit in Veterans for Common Sense versus Shinseki, have closed the door to class action litigation for the most part um, that seeks to challenge the systemic failures in VA and re remedy them. So that shoves closed an important door that we ought to consider. Um, and so it's really important that the political actors do their part. But there's more for lawyers to do, and I'll get to that as I wrap up. Now, there are going to be a lot of objections to my proposal that we have a statutorily imposed deadline, something like 90 days in Medicaid, or what about VA's own soft target internally, 125? They've said 125 days, so let's impose it on them. What are some objections to this? There are a lot. Um, there are a lot of reasons one might uh, consider this misguided, and I'd be happy to take your questions on those problems uh, during that opportunity. 
Let me close this way. Um, what I've described sounds very technocratic. I know it does, because it is. But the devil is in the details in these programs, in the lived experiences of the veterans and their family members and survivors who must interact with an enormous complex agency. And so when we think about procedural justice, when we think about dignity, we have to think in these terms because the programs are so large. And so we all have a role to play. Here in the clinic, we're using writs where we can to try to challenge delay in individual cases. We're looking at a fully developed claims program to serve uh, Boston area veterans. But I do think that Congress, based on the insights I mentioned, can actually just attack the issue frontally. And I would urge you to do whatever you can to speak up on this issue because it's really, really worth it. Thank you. So I think you can see why we are incredibly lucky that Dan is here uh, doing uh, work to tackle this problem right here in the Boston area and also engendering the kind of attention that it should get nationally. Uh, can you imagine um, sending people to defend this country who then um, cannot get the benefits to which they are statutorily entitled and can't even get an answer? Uh, in a reasonable period of time. So, Dan, thank you very, very much for that and for your sense of fairness and your sense of time. Um, our next speaker is Professor Glenn Cohen, and I say professor with delight because he was promoted this year. Uh, Glenn is going... <laughs> Ben is going to speak on the globalization of healthcare, a subject uh, which he is uniquely well situated because he is one of the world's experts on this subject. Uh, and I'm not sure if he chose that as a field because it means he travels around the world or, um, well, we'll hear why he chose it, but he's actually also truly one of the experts on bioethics and the law, generally, broadly put, the intersection of what might be called medical ethics and uh, health law. Uh, and his work on reproductive uh, technology, uh, research ethics, rationing of medical care and uh, legal services, health policy, are, are all extremely fascinating, as is his work on medical tourism, the travel of a patient from one country to another in order to obtain um, health care. Um, his many, many articles, his many, many interviews uh, in the media, his many, many activities uh, defy imagination. I cannot resist, though, but note that he also is a, a very popular teacher of civil procedure, uh, Glenn Cohen. While they're getting the slides up, I'll just say I want Professor Dean Minow to be my PR agent wherever I go with that introduction. Okay, I think now my time actually begins. This will advance. Great. Uh, well, actually, let me take the opportunity first to thank a couple of people who are in the room. It's rare that they're in the same room where I'm presenting, so I can take this opportunity. Uh, one is my assistant, Caitlin Burroughs. The other is the Petrie Flom Center's executive director, Holly Lynch, uh, and Chrissy Hutchinson, who's our administrative director, because they really make my life easy and help me produce these kinds of pieces. Everything I do on this topic is up online for the most part, so feel free to download if any of this catches your interest. So healthcare expenditures in the United States are currently about 18% of GDP. That's a share that's going to rise uh, steadily. If healthcare costs were to continue growing at the historical rate, uh, the share of GDP devoted to healthcare in the United States would be projected to reach about 34% by 2040. For households with uh, employer-sponsored health insurance, what that trend implies that we'll all be taking less in our take-home pay and more through employer-sponsored benefits. The rising share of health expenditures also has dire implications for government budgets. Although half of current health care spending is uh, covered by federal, state, and local governments, and if costs were to continue to grow at the current historical rate, uh, Medicare and Medicaid funding alone, both federal and state, would rise just those two programs to about 15% of the GDP. Of that increase, roughly one quarter would be estimated due to the aging of the population and other demographic factors, the other three quarters due to increased costs in health care. 
So the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, as people who don't like it seem to like to call it, if it works, will hopefully bend these numbers a little bit, bend the cost curves, we hope. But really, my big idea is to think about health care like other products. And I'm going to piggyback on someone else's even bigger idea, which was David Ricardo's idea in 1817, the British economist, one of the most important insights in history, the theory of comparative advantage. So this is a fundamental argument in economics in favor of tree, free trade among countries and of specialization among individuals. Ricardo said that there is a mutual benefit from trade or exchange, even if one party, the resource rich or the skilled artisan in his examples, is more productive or better in every respect than the less skilled or productive trading counterpart, just so long as each concentrates on the activities where it has a relative a relative productivity advantage. So this theory has been put to work in most aspects of our lives. The shoes I wear, I'll note that they are purple uh, suede today. <laughs> the shoes I wear, the food most people eat, what you type on on your computer, most of these have been made elsewhere. And the notion is, let American and America do what America does best and buy the products that other countries make better and more efficiently and more productively to us. And by trade, we're going to increase both our welfare and their welfare. Now again, to be clear, this is a distributionally complicated game. There are effects, there are winners and losers. But in the ideal situation over the long term, both partners in the trade can benefit if you focus on what you're good at. Now, my big idea is to say, why not trade in healthcare? And in fact, why not do the globalization of healthcare? And because this is a TED style talk, I've learned the genre of the TED talk is you've got to hawk your book a little bit. So this is a book I just did for Oxford University Press on this subject that I'm going to talk a little bit about here. And the idea is that healthcare should be treated as a globalized good just like everything else. So we're actually moving in that direction. And in this book, I talk about a few different um, uh, manifestations of this. One is medical tourism, as the dean mentioned. That is uh, the travel of patients from their home country to a foreign destination country in order to save on health care costs, to receive coverage from an insurer, or to access a service that is unavailable or illegal where they start out. Another is medical worker migration called the medical brain drain of physicians and other healthcare practitioners, largely a move from developing from the world to the developed world. Then there are also multi-regional uh, clinical trials. Let me say a word about that, the globalization of um, development, where research on a promising drug or therapy is conducted in part in developing countries, even though the fruit of that research will, at least in the short term, primarily uh, benefit users in the developed world. Then there's telemedicine. And in telemedicine, providers stay put, patients pay, stay put, but the medical care is provided remotely. Finally, there's the global intellectual property regime that both facilitates innovation, stymies access to drugs for desperately needed in the world's poorest places, and the flow of information and tissue back and forth. For example, the sharing of influenza vaccine strains during um, a pandemic to try to develop uh, vaccines uh, and the like for the pandemic. So this effect of globalization of healthcare is really massive, both in terms of the profits to be made and the consequences for the lives of individual patients. Let me give you a few statistics just to kind of walk you through this. So first, let's talk about medical tourism. So here, the studies come to varying uh, conclusions in terms of how much of it is going on. Very hard to collect this data, but it's no doubt that it's pretty significant. There's a Deloitte study that concluded that about 750,000 U.S. patients traveled abroad in 2007 for health care, and they expected that to go up to 6 million in 2010. That's probably an overestimate, but it gives you a rough sense of the scale here. In one year alone, about 952,000 Californian residents, roughly half of whom were Mexican immigrants, traveled to Mexico for medical care, dental care, prescription drugs. And looking more globally, in 2004, you had more than 150,000 foreigners seeking medical treatment in India, and that number was projected to increase by 15% each year since then. Malaysia treated 130,000 foreign patients, a 25% raise from the prior year. And the most recent figures reported uh, is that the country treated about 578,403 foreign patients in 2011. They keep good data, the Malaysians. In 2005, Bumangrad in, uh, in Bangkok, Thailand, one of the industry leaders, saw 400,000 patients in one hospital alone, 400,000 foreign patients. The revenues here are huge. 
In 2004, Cuba got about 40 million for medical tourism, Malaysia about 27.6 million, Jordan 500 million, and medical tourism in India will generate about $2.2 billion of revenue this year alone. And Thailand will earn about $8 billion from 2010 to 2014 in this trade. That market is likely only to expand in the near term. You've got a new European Union directive about cross-border reimbursement from one member state to another. You've got the four largest healthcare insurers in the United States looking at ways to build medical tourism into their insurance plans to give people incentives. You have state governments looking at budget deficits considering doing the same thing. So all in all, very, very interesting uh, time to be thinking about this. Talking about medical migration for a moment, the United States depends heavily on foreign trained doctors to staff its healthcare system. As of 2005, about a fifth of all doctors practicing in the US were foreign trade. The recruitment had serious effects on the supply of doctors in the developing world. Between 1986 and 1995, for example, 61% of all graduates of the Ghana Medical School left their country for employment reasons. Uh, the effects of this migration on rich and poor nations are immense. It's been estimated that roughly 3 million currently practicing healthcare physicians trained in less developed countries had migrated to more developed countries like our own. It would have cost us an average, them an average of $184,000 to train each of those professionals in more developed country. And that means that poor countries lost about $500 million and we gained roughly $552 billion as the developed world from this trade. Again, real possibilities for comparative advantage here. Telemedicine, everything from a teleradiology, someone in Australia or India in the wee hours of the night reads your scan, to telesurgery where there's a robotic arm there doing it and the doctor is someone else. What well, we think about the malpractice issues here, the coordination issues, the licensing issues. Um, I'll skip some of the details about uh, research and development tourism, just in the interest of times, except to say of the $39 billion that pharmaceutical companies spend on these activities, about 21% of them are spent outside of the United States, and much of that in the developing world. So these numbers tell you a piece of the story. They're dramatic numbers. This is economic globalization. But what about the law here? What about the ethics here? How should we think about these trends? Well, let me give you a few questions that I've tried to answer in my work. This is the teaser. We can talk more in the Q&A. Does medical tourism offer a viable and ethical way to expand access to healthcare domestically? What effects does it have on poor countries where patients are going? Does it siphon away doctors from the public system into the private system? How will the recent Obama health care initiative change uh, the dynamic of where patients are going and why they're going? Does medical tourism for services that are illegal in the home country, abortion, assisted suicide, reproductive technology, represent a problematic end run around domestic criminal prohibitions? Or is it instead an element of value pluralism, moral pluralism, a way of accommodating medical exiles, if you will? Should destination countries respect the legal prohibitions put in place by home countries for their patients? Under what conditions can home countries, governments, and institutions lawfully recruit physicians, nurses, and other healthcare professionals from the developing countries that face chronic shortages of the providers? When is it ethical to do so? Under what terms? Should the legal rules of licensing of physicians, the unauthorized practice of medicine, medical malpractice, choice of law, be altered to foster more robust telemedicine regimes? And who should pay for pharmaceuticals in the developing world? Is it a problem that we do many of these trials out there but have only short-term access for the people who need this? Is there a way of motivating uh, drug companies so they can actually make a profit and also improve access in this way? These and many other topics are the subject of my work, and I look forward to talking to you more about it. Thank you very much. You know, so far, People have been incredibly good about the time. This is unbelievable. Uh, so therefore, I, I think Glenn didn't have a chance to say that maybe we could um, actually challenge the world to make progress on our veterans benefits processing and, and, and maybe make progress on Jim's issue. It's just a tremendous delight to uh, introduce next Professor Jeannie Sook. Um, whose many, many awards uh, include the Guggenheim Fellowship, a recognition by the National Asian Pacific American Bar Associations uh, as best lawyer, uh, one of the best lawyers under 40, Federalist Society uh, here at Harvard's Intellectual Diversity Award, 
um, and I could go on and on. Her most recent book, At Home in the Law, How Domestic Violence Revolution is Transforming Privacy, was awarded the Law and Societies uh, Association's highest uh, prize for a book, the Herbert Jacob Prize. Um, Jeannie's work ranges across criminal law, family law, law of art and fashion, law of performing arts, um, and, and insights uh, that are relevant to ordinary life as well as to the law. Um, and her uh, uh, gifts as a teacher and as a colleague, I think, are well-renowned. I don't want to take a minute of her time. Jeannie Sook. So today I'm going to talk about trauma. Trauma is a concept that has unprecedented currency in our time. It's a concept that earlier generations barely knew, but that today is ubiquitous in public discourse. I'm going to talk today about the legal influence of what is essentially a theory of memory and its effects, and some of the biggest ideas that undergird our legal system are what it means to be responsible for something and what it means to be harmed by something. And today, the language of trauma is giving those pillars new shape, and we need to pause and think and reflect on what that means for us. In the past 40 years, our legal system underwent a massive revolution led by the women's movement and informed by feminist ideas. And the strand of feminist thought that became embedded in American law and legal institutions is most pronounced in the legal regulation of violence against women. We have seen cultural changes in the legal theory of harm in that context. Physical harm is not the only kind of harm that has been the concern of legal reform. Psychological or emotional harm has played a crucially important role, and the model of such harm that has risen in our legal culture is trauma. What is trauma? Colloquially, people use it to refer to an emotionally distressing or shocking experience. In medical language, post-traumatic stress disorder is said to exist when the memory of an event causes suffering from uncontrollable symptoms like depression, anxiety, and flashbacks and insomnia and nightmares. PTSD. Concern with Vietnam War veterans led to the professional recognition of PTSD as a diagnosis in 1980. But since then, it was the women's movement, with its focus on violence against women, that carried the language of trauma into legal conceptions of harm. The roots of trauma lay in the 19th century study of hysteria, which afflicted sufferers with unexplained symptoms, like paralysis, vomiting, and fainting, and spasms. Freud proposed that hysterics, who were women, these are women patients of his, that they had experienced an event, and the memory of that event was repressed into the unconscious mind, and that the repressed trauma was specifically of a sexual nature. The origins of the illness were childhood sexual experiences with adults, and repressed memories of those experiences were what caused the symptoms. Freud, of course, later concluded that his patients had not in fact repressed actual memories, but rather fantasies of sexual seduction. But the key insight was that the meaning of memories was what caused the suffering, whether they were fantasized or had actually happened. The seduction theory formulated by Freud was explicitly reinvested with meaning, with significance by feminists in the late 20th century in the form of sexual trauma. Beginning in the 1970s, a major project of the women's movement was creating social awareness of the prevalence of physical and sexual violence against women. Feminist influence research on the psychological effects of rape produced a landmark diagnosis, the rape trauma syndrome. We then saw the acceptance in most states of rape trauma syndrome evidence and rape prosecutions to bolster an accuser's claim that rape had occurred or to explain how otherwise strange-seeming behavior is consistent with having been raped. Concern about trauma fueled the widespread passage of laws that disable a rape defendant from cross-examining his accuser about her prior sexual conduct or her reputation. Rape shield laws 
reflect a concern to avoid subjecting an already traumatized victim to a second trauma in court. As the 1970s women's movement was just formulating its trauma narratives, the anti-war movement was in full swing as Vietnam War veterans were coming home and the era's anti-war politics contributed to hev very heavily to psychiatrists' recognition of the new medical diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, which was included for the first time in the 1980 edition of the DSM, DSM-3. So in the next few decades, we saw the growing acceptance of sexually abused and battered women as paradigmatic trauma sufferers. We saw the creation of the battered woman syndrome, which the domestic violence movement proposed as a form of PTSD to explain how battered women feel they are powerless to escape and thus stay in abused, re abusive relationships. The extremity of rape or war is increasingly not necessary to give an event traumatic meaning. The claims of PTSD in sexual harassment and discrimination suits are becoming much more commonplace. If you'll recall, Paula Jones in her sexual harassment suit against President Clinton included a claim that she suffered from PTSD as a result of his alleged conduct. In the, in the past several decades, we've seen increasing numbers of adults diagnosed with PTSD to explain problems like depression and relationship difficulties. A discourse of trauma has been adopted by the Supreme Court several years ago in Gonzalez versus Carhartt, where Justice Kennedy, citing a trauma-based brief, said that some women regret their choice to abort the infant life they once created and sustained, and that severe depression and loss of esteem can follow. A key move that we see in this discourse of trauma is questioning whether decisions that people have taken, often women, decisions that seem consensual, whether those decisions are truly voluntary. Right? Paradigmatically, the decision is agreeing to have sex that is unwanted. A feminist legal discourse has developed and become embedded in our law since the 1970s, and that is a discourse of women's trauma around their bodies and sexuality. So this is, um, this is part of a book that I'm working on called The Trauma Society, and the first part of the book is about women and sex. The second part of the book is about men and trauma of war, war combat, and those are the twin peaks. With our continual wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, it is in this period that the post-Vietnam recognition of PTSD is really coming home. President Obama has called post-traumatic stress the signature wounds of today's wars. And by comparison, previous veterans suffered in relative denial in eras where warrior ideal ideals were still deeply at odds with the feminization entailed in admitting psychological vulnerability. The Army has a new program to train our soldiers in emotional resiliency to prepare them so that they can be inoculated, in a sense, against trauma. Um, the same psychologist whose electric shock, shock experiments with caged dogs created the idea of learned helplessness and became the basis for battered woman syndrome that doctor, Dr. Seligman, is the research mastermind of the Army's resiliency program. Learned helplessness. Those dogs in, in electric shock cages had learned the opposite of helplessness. They had learned, some of them, to exert some control. And thus emerged from Dr. Seligman the theory of learned optimism, which explained why some people were able to surmount difficult circumstances and setbacks that can destroy other people. So the Army has committed millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, to the training of soldiers based on this research, the same research that led to the battered woman syndrome. And from caged dogs to battered women, um, and then recently also the CIA's torture program in which Dr. Seligman's reputation became the subject of a controversy because it was reported that his theories about stress and learned helplessness were being used to create, to design an interrogation program that was intended to break detainees. So meanwhile, the traumatized soldier has captured the public imagination and the salience of PTSD has risen through veterans' contacts with the legal system, often as perpetrators of crime, and most notably, the propensity of male veterans to commit domestic violence crimes against their spouses and their families. 
And through trauma, it's the veteran status as both perpetrator and victim is being forged. So the increased attention to soldiers whose symptoms are linked to experiencing killing or harming people will change the cultural meaning of trauma. Not only the trauma of the victim of sexual violence, but also the trauma of the perpetrator of crime will become increasingly prominent. And trauma will increasingly frame what it means to commit crime, just as it now frames what it means to be a crime victim. So what have we gained and what have we lost in becoming a society that increasingly makes trauma central to human life in many domains? What effect does it have on our conceptions of ourselves? Do we suffer more? Do we suffer less? Do we just suffer differently by seeing ourselves as experiencing trauma? Does the category of trauma merely help us identify and describe or perhaps treat suffering? Or does it create suffering or enlarge ordinary suffering? We need to reflect on the relation between ordinary life and extraordinary events. Amidst the rise of trauma, we have begun to adopt trauma as a model for experiences that are not just ordinary. If so, should we be troubled by the increasing ease which, with which people's choices are understood to be not voluntary because of the trauma they've experienced? What is the relationship between trauma, suffering from trauma, and human agency? These are the kinds of questions that I think are really central to our legal system. And if I am uneasy about trauma becoming such a dominant cultural assumption about human experience and emotional life, it's not because trauma is not real. Rather, it's because that such a trauma-oriented society may produce traumatic suffering in its citizens, and it may increasingly undermine ideas of responsibility that the legal system uses to hold people to account for their actions. It risks eroding ideas of choice and agency, particularly in people already likely to be seen as irrational and disempowered. Thank you. We will have a chance for discussion and question and answer um, after our next and final speaker, Jim Greiner, uh, says that he hopes that, uh, uh, that when we have a HLS Thinks Big event three decades from now, where you will be speaking, Jim, uh, that the speaker will begin a talk by saying, imagine attempting to run a law office or court system without a statistician. Now, he may be saying this in part because he understands statistics, unlike the rest of us. Um, Jim uh, was a very effective lawyer for the Department of Justice, uh, then in private practice, when he discovered increasingly that in his fields of employment discrimination and voting rights, stat statisticians um, had an important influence that the lawyers didn't understand. He then uh, went back to school, got a PhD in statistics here at Harvard, and then we grabbed him to teach here. Uh, and we have been unable to count the ways in which that has been a good decision ever since. His courses in civil procedure uh, on expert witnesses, voting regulation are superb, and he does c focus his research on statistics uh, and the law in various areas. And with no further ado, I welcome uh, Professor Jim Greiner. A court system chief justice, a legal aid executive director, and a law firm managing partner walk into a bar. <laughs> they see a man sitting at a table. This man there is, well, a nerd. He has a pocket protector that contains pe several pens and pencils, and perhaps at this time in history, he has a slide rule in his belt. He doesn't comb his hair, and he looks like he doesn't get enough sun. Anyway, the Chief Justice, the Executive Director, and the Managing Partner walk over to this er, nerd, and he greets them. It turns out that he himself has called them to this bar at this time and place, and he makes the following proposition to them. He says, I propose to increase the productivity of your legal operations by a factor of two, or three, or five. Each of the individuals who works in your offices 
will be more efficient and effective at what she does. The increase in productivity and effectiveness will be so remarkable that in a period of a few decades, it will be impossible for anyone to conceive running a law office without the likes of me there. The change will be so profound that no one will be even be able to begin to think about going back to the old way of doing things. To accomplish this feat, however, you will have to make the following investment. You will have to take one or two or perhaps several FTEs that would otherwise have gone to hiring lawyers or paralegals or legal assistants, and you will have to give them to me and my staff. You will invest in certain equipment, and I will have ultimate control over that equipment. You will alter the basic day-to-day -day way you do things to conform the ideas that I bring to your offices. And I will not be able to, and will not anyway, explain to you everything that I am doing. I will provide you with enough of an intuitive understanding so that you have an idea of what is going on, but at some point I will simply say to you, you have to trust me. So here's the riddle. Riddle me this. What reception did this nerd's utterly absurd sounding offer receive in the minds of the Chief Justice, the Executive Director, and the managing partner? Well, it depends. Depends on when. Depends on where. Depends on exactly the nature of the nerd's offer. Let's suppose the year is 1985. So what, what happened in 1985 recently? Well, in 1978, the first spreadsheet was invented. 1979, the first word processor. 1981, the first PC. 1984 and 1985, the first graphical user, user interface. 1984, by the way, the, just a year prior to our hypothetical conversation, also saw the timeless release, or the, excuse me, the release of the timeless piece of cinematic history, Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> the nerd in this particular 1985 scenario is, of course, an IT specialist. And essentially, over the next three decades, the Chief Justice, the Executive Director, and the Managing Partner all took the IT specialist up on his offer. And this IT nerd delivered on his promises. All of them. It is no longer possible to think of running a court system, a legal aid office, or a law firm without major investments in computers and information technology. And here's the key. We love to hate our computers. We love to hate our IT equipment. And when we are pre being, being particularly short-sighted and foolish, we love to hate our IT staff. But no one regularly looks at IT personnel and says, wow, there goes an FTE that I could have dedicated to another lawyer or another paralegal or another legal aid assistant. I could hire more lawyers if I could just get rid of them. No one thinks of that on their work, even on their worst days. Now suppose instead of the year 1985, the year is 2013. This time, let's make the nerd in our hypothetical bar conversation a woman just so we can distinguish her with pronouns. This female nerd is, well, a statistician. And the statistician offers the chief justice, the executive director, and the managing partners essentially the same deal. Give me one or perhaps a few FTEs out of your finite resources. Accept the fact that you will not understand everything that I am doing and that you will have to change part of your day-to-day -day operations the way I tell you to. I will increase your productivity and your effectiveness so greatly that in a few decades, life without me will be simply unimaginable. Can the statistics nerd deliver on this promise? I think she can. And the remainder of my time, I will focus on the legal aid executive director because that is the cause nearest and dear to my heart. I submit to you, though, that the principles I'm about to discuss may apply equally to the chief justice, who may be facing questions regarding when and how to deploy ADR schemes, whether to embrace and promote active case management, or whether to adopt certain discovery devices as a case management tool. The principles will equally apply to the managing partner who faces decisions about how to structure teams, how to provide new recruits with appropriate networks, and how to solicit clients effectively. But back to the legal aid executive director. What are some of the major questions affecting legal aid executive directors in the modern era, and what can a statistician offer? Here are a few examples. Recruitment of clients. 
How should you, a legal aid directive, uh, executive director, recruit clients? Sometimes this is even just a matter of getting clients. You would think there would be too many, and in many cases there are not. In modern credit card and consumer debt collection proceedings, what is the primary problem that legal aid executive directors face? Getting clients, getting people to show up. How do you do that? How do you mail them uh, messages that they will open? How do you contact them to get them to show up as defendants in court proceedings? The hypothesis is, is if, you, if you could get them to show up, you could win their cases, but you can't get them to show up. It's a matter of getting the right clients, getting clients at all. Sometimes it's a matter of getting the right clients. Here's a hypothesis for a legal aid director. If a client can find you in the modern setting, that is prima facie evidence that the client may not need you. If a client can find you, then she is able to fight her way through an intake system, through social barriers and networks that require her to, that, that a search. She is able to complete that search. Therefore, she is prima facie able to negotiate complicated systems and articulate enough to articulate her story to you, the lawyer. She may not need your help, or she may be net less needing of your help. Triage, assigning different levels of treatment or assistance to different types of clients. How do we make those decisions? Are the, are the triage systems we have in place doing what they want them to do, what we want them to do? Telephone assistance, also a product of scarcity. Is teaching people to help themselves over the telephone a constructive way to go about providing legal assistance? As an educator, I am extremely concerned. I cannot imagine teaching people law over the telephone. I don't do it. I see some of my former students in the room. What is my rule in classes? You cannot ask me legal questions over email. I will, I will refuse to answer those and I will set up an in-person in, in meeting, not a telephone meeting. I've made huge, several huge assumptions here. One is that the executive director desires efficiency and effectiveness, and I think that one's okay. I think I'm on a K on that one. Here's another one, that we know what efficiency and effectiveness are when we see them. What are the goals we're actually attempting to further? Take a legal aid program's government benefits practice. Should a practice strive to place as many of its potential clients on the most lucrative form of government benefits possible? That seems like actually a legitimate and worthy goal to me in certain settings, but it's not an uncontroversial one. And I actually think that putting a nerd, a statistician on the scene, starts making legal aid and indeed all law offices ask questions about why they're there. I mean, come on. Nothing inspires a good, solid, constructive, existential debate about the purposes of a law office than a pocket-protecting wearing nerd with broken glasses and unwashed, slicked-down hair who wanders around saying, what can I measure for you today? How in the world is she supposed to know what to measure unless you tell her what is effective, what, what effectiveness means? I leave you with a final challenge. Neither the IT nerd nor the statistician in my scenario fully disclose the risks that, they, that their uh, program brings to law offices. What, was, what were the risks that the IT nerd brought to the, brought to the table? Depersonalization. We're going to be communicating through technology now, no longer face-to-face. -face. What is the risk that the statistics nerd brings to the table? Do you know what cases or individual people are called when they become parts of a statistics study? Units. That's what they're called. And the fundamental challenge that I leave with you, and I hope that you can provide the answer for me with, is how do we do we implement a statistical agenda that shows efficiency and effectiveness without turning people into units, without losing the individual focus that our legal system purports to implement for each person? Thanks very much. Harvard Law School thinks really big. I am so eager to invite you to join a conversation uh, that is stimulated by these tremendously challenging and interesting talks. And as I do so, I'm just going to restate for the record that speakers in the span of less than an hour have touched on 
let's see, social science, social movements, uh, economics and efficiency, philosophy and ethics. Uh, Dan Nagan, Professor Nagan's wonderful question, why should it be that uh, veterans benefits are treated differently than uh, social security benefits when it comes to having firm deadlines about processing uh, claims? Um, actually reflects the in crucial move of any advocate, which is comparison. Find an anchor to something and, sh and ask why is this other thing not like that? Um, Glenn Cohen's uh, very uh, provocative uh, in invitation to think about healthcare as a globalized good like any other health uh, any other good like his uh, suede shoes. Um, it not only makes us notice his sartorial elegance, but also um, uses the uh, crucial technique of of asking about underlying structures and functions. Um, and if we don't do that in the law, what are we doing? But if we do it in a surprising context, which he does so well, um, that may provoke new thought as well as new action. Jeannie Sook asks about the impact of a shift in discourse, the way we talk about ourselves, so that we increasingly use the language of trauma to talk about ourselves as well as to talk about large scale issues like war and rape. How does that discourse affect who we are and our sense of choice? Um, this um, uses the, the critical technique of um, self-reflection about the way in which our language affects our own construction of our relationships with each other. Another vital approach um, that uh, lawyers at their best can use. And Jim Greiner brings us jokes um, and also the very, very serious question about whether and how the use of statistics and uh, quantitative tools can improve access uh, to justice or jeopardizes the very core insight of the recognition of the unique dignity of each person. Um, heady stuff, indeed. Questions, comments, the floor is yours. That's be good. I want you guys come on over, bring your chairs over while they're doing that. Okay, would you please start us off? Okay, I have a question for- But do say who you are. Okay, I'm Bala Daran. I'm a visiting professor. I have a question for Jim. Um, in your example about the three people walking into a bar, um, I could understand in 1985, you know, the IT person walking in, um, there was a big change in IT and there was a, a clear need for a new technology to be brought in. With, with statistics, uh, why now? Is, is there anything new that's happening that has made it different now than it was, say, 30, 40, 50 years ago? No. <laughs> what has to happen, I think, is a entirely intentional and, and, and political movement towards the recognition that uh, statistics and, that, and, and, a, and a quantitative way of thinking can provide enormous benefits uh, to the efficiency and effectiveness of law offices around the country, as well as raise, as well as uh, help lawyers think about fundamental existential problems. In some sense, I think we are where medicine, I hope, I should say, we are where uh, portions of medicine were in roughly 1938 or 1940. So we have around 70 years of catching up to do. Um, in this, and the move towards randomization at about, this, at about this stage in the assessment of new medical devices and new drugs was not an inevitable historical move. It was an entirely intentional process where people had to argue for it, people had to persuade each other that this was the right thing to do, that the world was going to be a better place if you did this, and uh, there was opposition. There was honest opposition, there was honest disagreement, and persuasion had to take place. Um, there was nothing particular about that time period either in some technological sense. The, the idea of randomization and experiment had been invented earlier depending on when you peg the invention point much earlier. So this is a, this is a matter of starting a political movement. Um, and there's no particular reason why now has to be the time except that it's not gonna happen unless we make it. 
Can I say one thing to add on where I'll slightly disagree? I credit Brad Pitt on this as well. Because as you know, Brad starred in Moneyball, right? Which is a film about applying statistical methods. So when the nerd looks like Brad Pitt, it turns out to be easier to sell. That's all I'll say. Can I have just one quick follow-up? I mean, um, would um, you, know, you see a lot about this big data. Uh, is that a possible additional motivation or perhaps the um, uh, availability of some new algorithms or technologies? So I think there's no question that technology and the ability to analyze very large amounts of information very quickly and the ability to miniaturize the analysis so that instead of having you know, a, a large computer necessary, you can have a simple laptop or desktop or some, perhaps something even smaller, has a role to play, absolutely no question. However, some of the most powerful uses of quantitative techniques are think small ideas, small scale randomized experiments. And those could have been done decades ago. We have been here before. There are, I am now reading the academics that were legal academics that were calling for this kind of change. And, and the dates of their articles are depressing. 1970, 1960, et cetera. So this is not going to happen unless we make it. I am reminded of a comment that Bertrand Russell once made, the philosopher, about Aristotle. Aristotle said many smart things, but one not smart thing that he said was that women have fewer teeth than men. Um, and uh, as Bertrand Russell said, well, he could have simply asked Mrs. Aristotle to open her mouth and counted, <laughs> but he didn't think to do so because he thought he knew. So it could be that one of the things that is new is that there's a little rise in humility among lawyers that wasn't always present, that maybe we don't know everything about the best way to, uh, to do what we do. Questions, comments? And say who you are. Uh, I'm Rebecca Gauthier, Harvard Law student. Uh, my question's for Professor Nagan. Um, you were talking about how, um, why the veteran's disability doesn't have similar kind of protections and deadlines like the social security disability. Um, and I think many would say the Social Security disability regime isn't very good either. It's slow to get to the decision. So what about kind of basing it more along the lines of the insurance industry's disability where you do have deadlines, but a lot of times claims are adjudicated way before the deadlines by creating more incentives on the people handling the claims to get them adjudicated quicker and putting more kind of procedure into how the claims are adjudicated. Do you think it's possible and advisable to kind of do more, a model more like that? Yeah, I think well, two things. Let me back up for a second. So Social Security actually doesn't have processing deadlines. So the problem is that in discussions about how to fix uh, VA, that Social Security is discussed not all the time, but perhaps too much as um, a model in terms of processing and computerization and dealing with medical records. And there's some value in looking to Social Security because comparatively they do some things better, not well, but better than Social uh, VA. Excuse me. So. SSA, Social Security, unlike food stamps and Medicaid and some other means-tested programs, um, doesn't have a hard deadline, external deadline. So as to the question about what internal procedures can make a difference, um, I th certainly think that there's an all-hands-on-deck approach. And what I propose is just one piece of a puzzle, which is thinking about hard external deadlines. And one of the things that VA is doing now, for example, that may go to some of what you're describing, is that they have a pilot program I don't even know if it's a pilot. They're trying to do it now, which is provisional approval. Any claim that's pending over a year, so long as they have some basic minimum present in the file to make a decision, they're going to grant it. But then they're going to continue to process the claim. Um, and there are a lot of problems with that model, uh, potentially, um, and a lot of uncertainty surrounding it. But that may be something that has some utility, per perhaps, but only dealing on the back end with existing problems. On the front end, the head of VA uh, disability uh, unit is looking to private the private market for solutions. And it may be, and I think it's quite possible, they're looking at insurance. Whether that is the panacea, I'm not so sure. I actually think that the hard deadline needs to, prov it needs that you need to have that benchmark there in order for all the other pieces, which need to be happening anyway, to have some end goal that people are anchored to. My name is George Salve. I'm a parent. Uh, question for Professor Sook. 
Um, in your example of the returning veteran who is both a potentially a, a victim and a perpetrator, in your view, legally, should the PTSD be a defense to a crime? Should it be a mitigation? Or should it be irrelevant or something else? Well, it's a great question. And I think our, our system has voted in, in the sense that today w we have seen, since about five years ago, our special veterans courts set up within our state court systems. We're not part of the military, like our actual state court systems, where veterans who are thought to have committed crimes because of their experiences in war and combat, because of the psychological issues having to do with that, are funneled into a different setting where the purpose is not to determine um, necessarily criminal responsibility and punishment, but rather to think about treatment and to get them out of the prison system. And that, I think, is a really enormous, um, it's a really meaningful thing because it's, if you really think about it, it's, it's kind of unprecedented. We, we have had different kinds of, we've had juvenile courts, we have special courts sometimes for different kinds of crimes, like domestic violence crimes and drug crimes. But this is really the first time, other than juveniles, where we have a court system for a specific category of person who has had a specific kind of experience, right? namely the experience of fighting in a war. And we are basically saying about this category of persons that they should not be treated in the same kind of way, right? That the, we shouldn't assess their responsibility in the same way, that we shouldn't treat them in terms of punishment in the same way, that we should focus on treatment. And I, I do think that um, even though I'm very sympathetic with having difficult experiences and then having to return and to integrate into life, that it, it has to be, we have to really reflect on what it would mean to say because you had um, the experience of war combat, it's not an issue of compensating you for injury and, and giving you benefits, but also that it's going to be a whole, wholesale kind of revision of our view of criminal responsibility in this context. And it, it matters because it's not just about the veterans, but about all kinds of other experiences that are increasingly every day being revised to be thought of as traumatic, right? PTSD is growing. It's growing and covering many, many more things, not just war, not just rape, not just seeing, you know, um, a fellow soldier being blown up next to you, but all kinds of experiences that we think of as unpleasant, but often have traditionally been thought of as part of ordinary life. And so the, the relation between the extraordinary and ordinary is really what I'm interested in. And so it's not so much about saying, no, the soldiers have to be held to the same standards as everybody else, but it, it does in the end, I think, mean that if we, if we don't do that, we have to actually revise our views of criminal responsibility and punishment, not just for the soldiers. Hi, I'm Caitlin Burrows. I'm from HLS, and I hope he'll forgive me, but I have a question for my boss. Um, so there's an argument to be made that the comparative advantage in terms of cost and regulatory oversight in countries like India and Bangladesh, where we go for um, surrogate pregnancies and for organ transplants, is because of a long history of colonialism and exploitation. It's cheaper there because their countries are less developed than ours because of the history of what Western countries have done to those countries. So is there a way that we can y take advantage of the comparative advantage of these countries in terms of cost as Western consumers and not continue that legacy of exploitation? And if so, what are the fail safes? Yeah, so of course, you know, almost every every answer I've ever given in my life begins with the words, it's complicated. And so I won't, I'll say here, it's complicated. Uh, I think actually it matters a little bit the setting. So surrogacy uh, is particularly interesting because there it's actually, to the extent you view it as exploitative, and it's a hard question because you're talking about women who live in compounds in a non-India, Dr. Patel runs the biggest one, they live in bunk beds. They're treated well, they're fed well, their kids are allowed to come, but the babies are taken away from them immediately. They're paid what it would take them to make five years in the regular labor uh, market there, right? So there is a hard question about whether you think it's exploitative or what is instead is exploitative is the status quo labor market in which they participate. But there you have a subset of the, of the population that is the potential victim uh, there. That's true also 
in uh, transplant tourism in a much more uh, robust way, I think, in that, first of all, it's illegal everywhere but Iran, and yet there is widespread kidney markets in Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Philippines that I've written about in some of my work. Um, and, but again here, these are people who are, start out in bonded labor, many of these people, and are using this as an opportunity to buy themselves out of bonded labor. So there is this real worry that an intervention that is prohibitory may make them worse off, not better off. Where I think the, the path is somewhat smoother and easier is actually when you're talking about buying things uh, that are legal in both places and that are not themselves morally contestable goods, like hip replacements, uh, cardiac bypass, where you're talking about it costing about 20 percent what the uninsured person would pay in the U.S., they will pay there. And what I've argued for in my, in my work here um, is that to the extent you have governments or insurance companies involved with this, we start uh, implementing essentially t taxation regimes where a portion of the money there is used to rebate. And then the other side of it is to, to kind of encourage um, developing countries to implement as part of their own regimes something that we've done in countries like France and Canada, which have mixes a public and private system, which is either to say to doctors, either you spend full time here and no time there, or to say to them, for every X many hours you spend in the private hospital, you need to do this much uh, in the public hospital. And also a piece of it is medical education. I mean, here at HLS, we have a pro bono requirement for graduating students, right? There is a question about, and this is also rural urban divides here, but whether there are ways of inculcating that. And that's connected also to the migration issue where it's complicated because the remittances Indian doctors living in the U.S. send back to their parents and family enrich them. And if the scales are different enough, it actually may enrich them more than the kids staying there. But this has a really interesting and complex distortionary effect on culture and family structure and the like. So to, to end where I began, it's complicated. <laughs> Dan, with uh, Steve Shea, um, Harvard Law School. Um, Dan, is there a budgetary aspect to this delay? Are there any winners from this delay? Um, does that mean that the VA survives on a lower budget and somebody doesn't want them to have a higher budget, or would they actually save money? Is, I'm trying to understand why this is, why the problem exists. Well. Um, it's a, it's a very important question. I didn't have time to touch on it, but um, your question gives me the opportunity to do so briefly. So on the first piece of it, the budgetary piece, the VA has said it doesn't need more resources. It needs better systems. Um, and so for a while, they, they took on, they sought and they took on more resources, did hiring and expanded to meet expanding need, although there was no planning ahead of time. So it was all happening sort of on the back end where they were putting out fires. Um, but VA has said, we don't need more resources. We need better systems. So that's point number one. Um, at least the agency itself, which you would think would be the most self-interested of all in accumulating resources, has said, no, this isn't really a resource problem. But that's a messy question because now they just instituted mandatory overtime for a whole slew of workers. So think of that what you might, okay? Um, so as to point number two about the why, the, the, um, uh, there are a lot of... Um, uh, forces that came together to create this perfect storm. Um, and so part of it was poor planning. Part of war planning is also planning for the cost of war, the human cost of war. And there was literally very, not enough planning and not enough effective planning as we fought two wars abroad for the human costs on the home front um, when um, soldiers returned and for their family members and survivors, both on the healthcare, healthcare side but also and specifically on the topic we're talking about, compensation benefits. There was no advanced planning for the onslaught. You also had a downturn in the economy, which um, creates different kinds of pressures for different kinds of people, obviously. Um, but then there are lots of other factors that fit into this puzzle. One is changes in medicine and some of the issues that Jeannie was touching on um, in terms of um, what gets diagnosed and how it gets diagnosed and the criteria that's used. Um, and also you have uh, aging veterans with compounding health issues who can file and do file and should file multiple claims for compensation. Um, the other piece of the puzzle is that there were several class action lawsuits that required um, VA to re-adjudicate pr uh, previously denied claims. Um, all of these things fit together. Poor planning, uh, new kinds of uh, claims, new kinds of injuries, multiple claims, multiple deployments, creating compounding medical and mental health issues, 
created this perfect storm where the agency just wasn't prepared to deal with this mess. They said it's a systems problem. I think to a large extent it is a systems problem, but this is a giant cruise ship and not a rowboat. And in order to move a cruise ship, it takes a lot more and a lot longer than it does to move a rowboat in a different direction. Um, and so that's why I actually think this benchmark idea, benchmark's not even quite the right word, it's a hard external deadline is useful because it sets up VA for the long term, the long term, not just with an internal guideline, but with an identifiable and hard um, goal that they can't change. And where there's a will, there's a way. Let Congress set the deadline and let VA figure out how to get there by using some of the tools it's already trying to experiment with. Yes. Uh, thank you. My name is Jas Amwai from Kenya. I'm a parent of Flora Amwai, a graduate in the law school. I'm a student at Moy University, doctor student. Um, I've an interesting scenario which I would like to maybe reflect and think with the so the issue of trauma I think is pervasive in our society and uh, I'm just trying to imagine because you said you're from a literature background so am I we've discussed it for a long time and in Africa it looks like what we are doing is we are talking about it rather plaintively. I'm a, a plaintive, you know, it's like we are apologetic about it. We come, we try to uh, allow ourselves to appeal for empathy. And in all our systems, yes, it's bad. But if I'm an alcoholic, seriously, I'll be punished by law and I'll be rehabilitated so that I get back to fit in the society. Now, what happens with someone who is prone to, um, who was traumatized, an individual? This is the first thing I would like to, uh, to, to think with you and reflect with you. What proactive uh, 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 situations are we creating so that eventually, even after, we have, we, we, even before we, take, we talk about rehabilitating and counseling the traumatized person, we are also um, including the perpetrator in our program because eventually we want him to remain part of this humanity. And he may not just do to the people immediately in his family, but ex extend it to other people. That's the first thing I would like to think with you because this is an issue that is globally um, giving us a lot of thinking. And in some cases, it's even, it even, uh, it's, it's even accepted by certain customs that a little patting of your wife, beating, is a sign of love. I don't know. I just want you to, to think with me. Uh, Professor Green, uh, 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 Greener, um, you've come up with uh, a, very, very, a very, very surprising perspective about you can't teach your student on telephone. What do you see as the future of uh, electronic learning in this perspective? Thank you. The, um, there are two issues. One is the perpetrator's trauma and the actions that the perpetrator may be seen to have taken arising out of the prior experience of trauma. And then there's the way in which our legal system here has understood what it means to be harmed, right? And the role that the understanding about psychological trauma plays in assessing what that harm consists of, yeah. right? what it means. Yeah. Right? And so there are, there are two things here. And increasingly today, I think, and especially because of the wars that we've been um, so deeply involved in, and the need, in fact, as you say, to integrate perpetrators yeah, perpetrators, yeah. back into our society, mm -hmm. right? If, if these soldiers do come home and then they, are, they do become embroiled in the criminal system because of mm -hmm. things they've done, um, because they're having trouble psychologically, right? The, and, the, and so we've had to really reflect until the, the parts of the women's movement that I was talking about initially really only grappled with the trauma of the victim. And the moral meaning of trauma 
was very, you know, much more straightforward then, which was that there was somebody who was victimized and somebody who was wrong. And so what it me meant to be traumatized was to be somebody who had been harmed wrongly, right? Today it's much more, it's much more ambiguous because we've had, we, we in our own criminal system have had to incorporate this idea that, that we don't talk about trauma only to explain how somebody was wronged and harmed and victimized, but also really to very seriously because of the need to integrate our soldiers yeah. back into our society, we're engaging actually sincerely with the notion of the trauma that the perpetrator experienced and also inflicted. Right. And so it's, it's, I think it's becoming a much less morally simple picture, mm. and the discourse of trauma is in some ways helping us to do that. Um, so I guess I am in agreement with you that by calling someone a perpetrator and saying you traumatized someone else, mm. that that doesn't mean morally you are beyond the pale, and that our legal system has a certain, you know, white, you know just a, a, a one-dimensional way of dealing with it. Yes, so thank you. In response to your question about technology and my, um, my questions about telephone assistance, I guess I would say a couple of different things. One is, for me, truth is what works. If it turns out that we run a test and telephone, or several tests, and telephone assistance works, then let's do it. And let's do it at the scale at which we're doing it in the United States right now. It is the overwhelmingly dominant way in which legal services corporation funded entities provide assistance. They do, it almost, they do it over the telephone. Yeah. My, que my points about it were simply to raise fundamental questions, to say, why would we think this works? If it turns out that it does, and, I'm, and my suspicions about it are unfounded, by all means, go forward. The second thing is to say, what would we do if we didn't do telephone assistance? Would that be better? The, uh, the question is always not, is this any good? Is it better than, than, some, other, than some alternative situation? Uh, the last thing I would say about it is that I am fundamentally suspicious about the supposition, which is prevalent everywhere in legal aid especially and in, in legal systems generally, that a, more is always better and a little bit more is better than less. That a little bit more always gets you a little bit better outcome. To me, the best analogy here is, what is the worst thing that you can possibly do for somebody who has an infectious disease? Give the person too little antibiotic. What does that do? It does not cure the disease, and it breeds antibiotic-resistant bacteria inside the person, right? So I am fundamentally suspicious about the idea, if it in fact, what we say is we care about improving people's outcomes, if that's the value, to say, well, we need to give a little bit of help to everybody who asks us to reach out. Because we don't know if we're doing that person any better, we're doing for that person any better than we would be if we simply slam the phone down on them. I think that needs to be tested. Now, if the value is some kind of statement about universality and, the, and validating the, 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 the self-worth of every person who calls, or perhaps teaching adjudicators lessons, this is a person, not a unit, on the other end of the phone. If that's what we're about, and we're, about, and we're willing to say, even though I can do no good for you whatsoever for this, for this, for, by this telephone assistance, with this telephone call, you would do just as well yourself by simply hanging up the phone. This is for me. I'm doing this telephone conversation for me, and I'm doing it for the adjudicators. Then we go forward with a telephone call, right? That's the kind of conversation that I think we need to engage in. That's the kind of conversation that statistics requires you to engage in. But again, my point here is to raise questions, not to necessarily say, I know. I don't know. My name is uh, Travis Cohen. I'm a statistician in the law school. So, <laughs> so my uh, first question, I guess, would be, uh, when is all this going to happen? Because it sounds great. Um, but my uh, second question has to do with your um, kind of your overall question about turning individuals into units, and so or, or cases into units. And so, um, you know, kind of a naive statistical viewpoint would be that great, right? We're, we're turning them into units. Uh, that's the ultimate form of justice, right? We don't know who they are or what their background is. Um, we can process kind of what is optimal or efficient once we define what that means um, kind of blindly, right? Um, so kind of what would you say to that? And kind of what do you, 
where do you think, I mean, I know this is a big question, but where do you think kind of the right mix between units and people are in this context? The fact that Travis is with us, by the way, is evidence that this law school took the bargain offered by the, by the uh, statistics nerd in the bar. There was actually a dean who walked into the bar <laughs> and said, I will take you up on your offer to try to transform, because in fact, Travis is, is on, on staff uh, here, at the, here at the law school. I guess what I would say about what, why is that a problem is that efficiency is not the only value, and that the, uh, the idea of treating people as units in the sense of blinding ourselves or wiping away irrelevant characteristics for them, and to that extent, you know, things that should not affect our decision making. Um, might be a good one. On the other hand, um, I think it affects the decisions that we make to know that there is a human being on the other side of every legal decision that is made. And one of the, th and in fact, the entire, you know, an, an argument for the precedent-based system upon which we base our common law system of adjudication is that there must be facts and the judges must confront those facts and the, pe the individual on the other, uh, in, in each individual case, because we think it changes that decision making. And I think that probably, I mean, again, this is a value judgment. I think that value is important. I think we would lose something fundamental, absolutely critical, if we said, no, 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 we actually are going to treat each person. I think it would change the nature of the decisions that we made, even if we were to treat people as units, if we simply thought of them that way. I think we would reach, we would reach a different kind of decision. Um, as far as when all this will happen, I do not know, and it is not going to happen unless we pull and we fight and we make it happen. I'm going to say something on, on, on Travis's question also, actually. So right now I'm editing another book on what's called Identified versus Statistical Lives, which is exactly this problem. And it turns out, so it's social scientists, ethicists, uh, it's a very interesting mix, some law people, some medical people. It turns out that we're wired a certain way, and I'm going to say more so than Jim, I think it's a bit unfortunate, but this is just a reality of human nature. And we are wired in a way that we always divert resources towards identified people over statistical people. So if it's a question of saving 10 miners underground, versus investing in the kind of machinery that would save a thousand miners before they get trapped, we will, to a man, always do it. We will always invest in getting the children out of the well and the like. And there are these great social science experiments. This is my favorite one. It turns out even the littlest bit of identification will do this. There's a game they play where you divide a pie up amongst various people. And in one version, they're told, um, you know, please decide one of the people in this room will get this size, one of the people will get this size. In the other version, they say, one of the 10 people in this room, and you're not actually in a room, you're asked to imagine a room, you think they're on the other side. Decide whether number five will get this much or not. Merely by telling the person that there's person number five for whom you are deciding about, rather than one of the 10 people in this room, it turns out it has a major, significant, huge effect size difference on the willingness to give and how generous people are. So it turns out, again, we are set up this way to like identified lives. Why I think it's unfortunate is that there are many instances in which we could do much more good for the world by putting blinkers on and imagining ourselves behind veils of ignorance, just thinking about what we do, and yet we are pulled. Now, that said, in the legal services context, there are funders here. There is a political dynamic. If you have a good story, a good population, you know, Care Bears is the way I like to think of it. Everybody likes Care Bears. If your clients are Care Bears, it becomes easy. If your clients are slugs, it becomes very hard, right? Nobody wants to give that person a hug. And so I'm very motivated by the fact that, uh, you know, that we are built this way, and I think I just have to take it as a fact of life, although I always like to push people and try to, to get them to think a little bit more more globally and a little bit more anonymous. So I think you and I might slightly disagree on this. We, we disagree on a lot, which is what makes our friendship fun. <laughs> well, I think that we have heard a remarkable range of ideas, and they're big. They share a concern about how can the efforts made in the name of law or policy be more effective, but then what do we mean by effective, and what's fair and how does the way that we structure all of it affect who we are and how we think of ourselves? That's what I uh, walk away from uh, thinking, and as well as wanting to argue, I think, uh, and discuss further. 
Um, I also am very struck by this notion that we're wired in certain ways. We are wired in certain ways, and the influx of social science uh, and other kinds of uh, sciences to law, I think, is only to the good. But we're wired in another way, which is that we like to eat. And so the food for thought that we've had here, I think, will actually go better with food for the body, which will be outside. Please join us for more conversation and join me in thanking our wonderful speakers. <laughs>